And it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. And I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who, he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the, man, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has a bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of earth belongs to earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what we have seen, what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives a spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son, and he has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Amen. Um, through, through the study of this chapter, um, I came up with six different points that spoke to me from this chapter that I want to um, just go on chronologically as we go through, as we go through the chapter and... Um, not necessarily covering it to every extent. Um, I would hope there would be some time at the end if Father Lord wants to close in any gaps that I that I miss. Um, uh, but we'll see how time um, allows. Um, so from the very from the very beginning in um, chapter three, it talks about Nicodemus and and a big. Um, Note to take as 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 it talks about him coming to see Jesus as a man came to Jesus by night, and there's different different uh, perceptions on on exactly why they included the the detail about coming by night, and there's 
there's a fact of him possibly being in, embarrassed or ashamed to be in front of his fellow Sanhedrin. And there's also people who say that it's because he could um, get Jesus' full attention because during the day he was surrounded by the multitude. But as I was debating between the two, um, we see the confusion that Nicodemus goes through in this concept of being born again. And at the end of you know everything that Jesus said, you don't see Nicodemus walking away with any more clarification than he started with. You know, and I, 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 the belief that I have is, um, as my first point says, we will never understand the plans of the Lord if we only want to live for Him in secret, if we only want to see Him by night, if we're ashamed to be by our you know surroundings, by our fellow brothers, by our you know who we are. Do people know on a daily basis who we are as Christians? Uh, what is our, you know, how bold are we in what we believe? How, how um, confident are we able to say that we are Christians in front of our, you know, co-workers, in front of friends, in front of, you know, random strangers? Um, and I see that the fact that Nicodemus um, at first is, is questioning all this, you know, he's, he's a little bit ashamed to question or to you know, admit that, Rabbi, we know that you're from God. We know all this because, you know, all his other um, co-workers, if you may, would, would question that, would wonder exactly if that's actually true. And he comes by night, and it seems like it's only, you know, at that moment that, you know, he wants to actually be bold enough to admit that Jesus is obviously, you know, from God with his works. Yet he doesn't really understand um, the concept that Jesus is bringing forth here. And... And to be born again is something that we as Christians need to need to have a firm a firm grasp on, and especially young kids and youth. You know, if I was to ask you, write down a piece of paper, what does it mean to be born again? Could you tell me? What would be your guys's? You know, each and every one of you. What are if I if I simply wanted you to write down what does it mean to be born again? You know, think in your mind exactly what that means to you, and. What I wrote down for my second point was being born again means we have a completely new perspective on life in every aspect. And only at that moment can, I, can we truly say that we've been born again, whether we've been baptized in water and, and you know, whether we go to church all the time. If we don't have that completely different perspective on life, I cannot say that we're truly born again. And, and Jesus talks about how you know, what's born of the flesh is flesh, and what's born of the spirit is spirit. And how the wind blows where it wishes, you hear it sound. And, and I like the concept because, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, you never see God. How can you believe in God? How can you, you know, you never, how can you believe something you've never seen? And, you know, the easiest comparison is, you know, just like the wind. You don't see, you don't see the wind, but you feel it. You see its movement. You see exactly what it does. And it's the same way with God and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, a thing that I want our our kids of this church and our youth to grasp, you know, am I born again? And if I'm not, you know, what does it take to get there? What does being born again mean to me? What does being born again, you know, what effect does that have on me? In my day-to-day -day walk, what are my goals? What are my aspirations? You know, what am I seeking day after day? You know, we all have, you know, the different portions of our life we're going through, you know, whether it's, you know, figuring out our career, figuring out... Um, you know, who we're, who we're going to marry, you know, raising kids and so forth and the jobs that we have, you know, but at the end of the day, being born again needs to be above all of that. It needs to be above what we focus on, you know, our little daily tasks. And we need to, we need to really reflect is, are we born again Christians? Is our every day, can we say at least throughout our day at some points that we think about the gospel, that we think about the impact that God has on our life, that we think about, you know, how can we serve God? You know, just like Brother Hotia said, you know, you end the day and you wonder, did I do anything for God today? You know, did I, did I make an impact for his kingdom? Um, in verse 12, it says, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And my third point was, we must f first learn the smaller lessons and principles before we can understand the heavenly ones. And as Christians, it's very easy to get to that phase where, you know, we want to go from 
being baptized in water to, you know, within the next two months, we suddenly want to have this, you know, gift of healing, or we just want to have, you know, these visions, these, you know, we want to have these, you know, encounters with God, you know, simply from one end to the other, we want to, you know, jump through these hoops and, and have this, you know, amazing experience with God. But I think a lot of, a lot of us um, struggle with the fact of, you know, the, the smaller things that we need to learn in God, the smaller principles, you know, we, we all want to be characterized as Christians filled with the Spirit. We all want to be characterized as, you know, Christians that can say that we, under, that we can communicate with God, that God, you know, knows, you know, exactly where we're coming from. But many times we can get caught up in the, in the mentality of the only thing we want is just to have these amazing gifts and these experiences, but we're not willing to do the little things such as submit to our parents, you know, follow, follow the orders that were given in the church, you know, work on our anger issue, work on our patience issue, work on, you know, the sin that we have behind the scenes, you know, instead we just want to attain all these amazing things. And I think that, you know, this verse, you know, is a very good example of how can we, how can I tell you heavenly things if you're not even on the earthly things yet, you know, and as it goes later in the New Testament, it talks about, you know, you're on the milk, I can't even get you to the solid food, you know, and it's just, you know, it's that process, you know, which I see every day with, with JJ, you know, eventually he's moving on to the little soft food, and then one day he's going to be eating the hard food, and it takes time, and it's, it's a, it's a work in progress, but um, we need to be willing to make, make the sacrifices now on, on all the little things that are around us, you know, are we a people that are full of the fruits of the Spirit, can we say we're patient, can we say we have self-control, you know, do we have anger? Do we have, do we have bitterness in our life? Are we willing to work on these little things before we come before God and want these amazing encounters and experiences and um, spiritual moments in God? Um, in verse, verse 14, it talks about um, the passage in the Old Testament where Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And it says, so the Son of Man must, may be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And that concept of, of the snake, um, the serpent on the, on the stick raised up um, is a very interesting one to me, and it's always caught my attention. I find it um, pretty interesting how in ambulances you see the serpent on the stick, you know, but we're, uh, we're going to deny God and we're just going to, you know, act like that's not something specifically from the Bible. You know, if you've, it took me years before I started noticing that, you know, but there's a serpent on a stick on an ambulance, you know. The salvation, which is, you know, from the Old Testament. It talks about it again here. And, you know, if you go back to read that passage, there's a lot of people that died from be being bit by the serpent. And the simplest thing they had to do was to look up at that and they would not, they would not perish. You know, and it seems so simple. It's how did so many, and it was thousands upon thousands that died. How did so many people die when all they had to do was look at the serpent? I know some people died before the serpent was raised up and whatnot, but, you know, I think so many people were too stubborn to believe, like, oh, looking at a serpent, that's going to save me? No, like, I'm in, a, I'm in a crazy situation here. This is not a time to go and find a serpent to look at on a stick. You know, what are you guys talking to me about this, this nonsense? You know, what, I, I just got bit by a snake, and you guys are going to tell me to look at a serpent on a stick? You know, I can, I can see the stubbornness that was probably in the Israelites at that moment, and it's so relevant in today. I have all these things going on in my life. I have these financial struggles. I have these issues with my family. I have these issues with my job. And you're going to tell me to go spend my time at church on a Sunday? You're going to tell me that I need to, you know, take my time and, and do my Christian walk? I don't have time for these things. I have all these other things. And it's in the same way, it's just a stubbornness. And, and the, the beauty of it is, you know, looking at Jesus gives us salvation. Just looking at the serpent would, would save them. And it's a simple fact, if we look to Jesus and we acknowledge that, you know, only with Jesus can I actually have life after this life, can I actually even have life in today with my life being full of purpose. You know, and I say it time and time again from here, you know, you, the, the greatest struggle of teenagers today is not having a purpose in life. The greatest struggle of all time. You know, a lot of people, you know, will go to the suicide, will go to all these different directions because they have no purpose. It's not that they didn't have, you know, plenty of people be like, you know, we loved him. They knew we were friends. They have people who loved him. They have, you know, certain types of success in their life. But at the end of the day, it's the purpose 
that everybody craves inside their life. No matter who you are, everybody wants to have some sort of purpose. You know, and it's, it's, it depends on what we want to find it in. But, you know, it, it's, it's something that as, as we look to Jesus, you know, we start to find our purpose. We start to acknowledge that, you know, as, as crazy as that sounds to people, just looking to Jesus with all the problems we're going through, that's what's going to give us life. That's what's going to give us a purpose. That's what's going to give us value in this life. We're not just going to go, you know, just, just a wave tossed by the wind. And um, I, really, I really think um, as, as parents, one of the biggest things you need to pray for your, for your kids is for them to find, find their purpose. Because, you know, everything else will attach itself, the career, the, you know, the spouse and all those other things, you know, but pray a lot for your guys' children and helping them find their purpose. And if, if you see, you know, them starting to figure out, make sure you guys give them a push from the back because it's, it's so sad to see people that just have no idea where they're going and they have those moments where you think they're all right. And later they'll tell you about, you know, you can start to unfold the moments they have in depression and loneliness and, and dissatisfaction with this life. And they have such highs and they have such lows. Uh, so I encourage you guys as parents, you know, try to, you know, try to help your guys as young kids from a young age. Find that purpose and make sure they're not, you know, confused on, on what a purpose means. You know, not in just... Your only purpose is, you know, I'm going to put you in school and you're going to have this great career. Because that's the only type of mentality and purpose we're shoving into our kids. You know, there's going to be tough times ahead when they're, when they're teenagers. And I can tell you guys that now. Um, so we know, we've all, we've all um, memorized the verse of John 3.16 and, and the impact that it has. And that goes forward with, you know, looking to Jesus and the amount of, of satisfaction we have in in that, you know, he gave his only son for us and, and we're free of condemnation. But as it goes into verse, verse 19, it's a very interesting um, concept and it's something I even touched on when I went um, to the first four books of John just quickly on different topics. And verse 19 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And my, my point, which I um, have it phrased as a question is, are the things that we do, the daily things that we do, do we want them in the light, or are they things we don't want exposed? And... An interesting concept that, I was, that came to me as I was meditating on this was many times we wonder where God is when, when we're going through those troubles, when we're dealing with that trial, when we're having that prayer that we don't have an answer to. Yet at the same time, when we're in our sin, when we're living a sinly life, we're hoping that God isn't watching. You know, and it's that concept of God, where are you? Where are you? But when I'm sinning, it's like, oh man, I hope God's not here paying attention to this. I hope God is not taking notice of what I'm doing right now, of what I did last night, of what I did, you know, during the day. And it's, it's this mentality as Christians, can we have our daily activities exposed to the light? I'm not talking about just that time you spent with God. You know, I'm not talking about just the time we have on Sunday. You know, on a daily basis, can your life be projected on a screen? Would, uh, wh where, what would you feel? You know, what would, what would go through your mind? What would go through your heart if someone was to, you know, just portray everything that we're going through? And... It talks about how, you know, those that are in sin don't want to come to the light. And it's very obvious because those that live deep in sin, they struggle to be at church. They struggle to be in this building because they can feel it festering inside of them. They can feel the pains inside. They can feel, you know, that it's not right, that something's off, that oh, I, don't, I don't want to be here because, you know, they'll just give you the classic, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time because inside you're dying. Inside you're, something's, you know, something's you know, bothering you. And when we're, when we're actually in the light and we're living, it says, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that he may be clearly seen as works being carried out in God. You know, when you're, when you're in the right place spiritually, you have a different excitement for church. You have a different excitement to get into prayer. You have a different excitement to go to that gathering. You know, and it's something we need to, 
focus on daily because it's very easy for us to fall into those moments of where we believe nobody sees what we're doing, you know, but God's always watching. And as we go forward um, to the to the last um, section of this chapter, it talks about John the Baptist and and how and how you know they're baptizing and and his disciples come up to him, hey, he's doing it too, you know, aren't you upset that he's infringing on your on your ministry? Aren't you you know a little bit worried that he's getting more followers than you are? Then he's getting, you know, more more success than you are. And John's response here is one of one of my favorite responses. It says, Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. And my final point is our greatest joy should be when we decrease and Christ increases in us. When we see more of Christ inside of our hearts and less of us, that's a time of celebration. That's a joy. That's an excitement. And you know, something I've, I've been asked before and I've even probably said before to the men's group, whatever, like, would you, be, would you be happy with a John the Baptist ministry? If that, was, if that was your life, you do all this effort, you put in all this time with God, you're connected with God, and it's a six-month ministry, and suddenly you go from, you know, everyone knows John the Baptist where you're just cast in the shadows, you go to prison, boom done, your head's cut off, but you, but you did your part. And it talk, later Jesus talks about how there's no one greater born of woman than John the Baptist and the amount of impact he had in just six months. You know, but youth today, we all want to have these amazing ministries. We all want to have these, you know, ideas of a mega church or ideas of who knows what. You know, what your, your deepest desire needs to be, you know, Christ is increasing in you in whatever aspect you're doing. Maybe what you're doing for God is something that's going to be in the shadows for the rest of your life. Maybe the way God's going to use you is going to be something that no one will ever take notice of. You know, but at the end of the day, that's where our joy is going to be complete. That's where our joy is going to be in its fullness. And, you know, just like Donnie said, it's as Christians, we need to have that joy. It needs to be something that's inside of us. And, and even beyond, you know, the fact that, you know, we're saved and we have this, you know, I... I reason to be excited and reason to be a joyful people you know we need to take it a step even further to where you know we know that we're being used by Christ in whatever shape whatever manner you know and that needs to be our greatest joy and John says no one can receive anything unless given to him from heaven and he who comes from above is above all and he who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way you know do we do we speak in an earthly way, you know, are our desires earthly or are they above, you know, and it's, it's something that, you know, we can get very caught up in with what's here, what's now, what's, you know, pressing on our, pressing on us right now, especially, you know, teenagers today, you know, what's, what's currently happening, you know, especially now with, with social media and everything, you're in the mix, you know, everything that's most popular right now, you know, everything that's happening in, in sports, everything that's happening in, you know, the grand scheme of things, and we get caught up in, in, you know, all these earthly things, and we can talk with somebody for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and they can never sense at one moment that we have a, a Christian, a Christian uh, foundation inside. You know, and as you guys, as, as, as you guys go through, through school, through work, through all the different places we go, can people sense that there's something greater that you focus on? Is there something greater? Like, can people, can people sense that you're not that consumed with this world and now? Because that always seems to shock people. It's like, oh, wow, all this is going on, all this is going on, you don't, and you're just, you're just like this, you know, you can just keep going on, you're not constant. You're, you're not consumed with all these other factors, with all these other things. And, and I, um, when I first started at my, at my job, you know, obviously everybody starts to notice from the beginning if you, you know, aren't sitting there cussing every other word or, you know, saying whatever nonsense. You know, but it goes, it goes a step further. You know, they, they, they would say it's like, my or even my friend who I talked to you guys multiple times who works next door to me, he's like, we didn't talk about anything religious. We didn't talk about anything, you know, Jesus oriented. But from the very beginning, 
He's like, I could tell that there was something different about you than all the other guys who have managed the pain store next door. I can tell there's some, you know, there's, there's a different aspect, there's a different vibe that you give off as a Christian. You know, you're not, you're not focused on all this other garbage that the world fills us with. You're not focused on all this other, you know, worthless temporary things that the world seems to make so important to us right now. Um, if you guys could just please stand with me. I know I kind of went through the chapter at, um, at a faster pace, but um, I think these six points are something that we, we really need to reflect on as we, as we go into prayer, especially, you know, for, for our youth and for our younger kids, because these are foundational, foundational items that they need in their life if they're going to, you know, have lives of impact in this world and, and you know, to carry, to carry the name of Jesus further. So if we just go into prayer about these things, amen.